This is the Supernatural Book, Episode 4, The Cherubim and the Flaming Sword. Okay, the devil's plan had worked. Not completely. He didn't get Adam and Eve's soul. But he did lead them down a road of spiritual and physical death. They died spiritually. Will one day die physically. They would live about 900 or so years and die physically. At least Adam would. And the Lord had a temporary remedy. The shed blood of an animal. The devil had a hand in getting sin into the world. It came in through Adam. And Adam could have stopped it. He had the weapon. The words of God. The sword on his side. The little bit of word of God that, he's ha that he had was his sword. All he would have to do is quote scripture and believe it. But he didn't raise the sword against Lucifer. He chose to die with his bride. This led to Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. They could no longer live rent free. Genesis 3.24 says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So picture the sin in your mind. Adam and Eve just got kicked out of their home. Imagine the devastation. To make sure that no man ever enters the garden, to eat off of the tree of life and live forever, the Lord placed cherubims at the east of the Garden of Eden. You see, God isn't a mean and hateful God. He doesn't want Adam to live eternally in a sinful, evil, wretched condition, which is exactly what would have happened. You see, he had sin running through his veins. If he would have took off the tree of life, he would have lived forever in that sinful state. And this is what the transhumanists desire today, to live eternally in a sinful, vile, evil, and wretched condition through technology. Of course, they don't see themselves that way, but that's exactly what we are. We don't need to live forever in this vile body that we have. We need a new body to live forever in. So the Lord put cherubims to guard the way, to make sure nobody ever gets in there and eats off of that tree. But now this flaming sword, which turned every way, what is this? Oh, just another one of the Lord's weapons. You know, we've already talked about the sun as his weapon. The devil himself could be his weapon. Revelation 19.15 talks about a sharp sword that goes out of his mouth. In Numbers 22.23, the Lord shows up as the angel of the Lord with a sword drawn in his hand. The angel of the Lord was actually the voice that you heard walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He's the hero of this story. Even when you don't see him, he's in the shadows, fighting battles that nobody sees. At this point in the story, he is mysterious. But soon he will be completely revealed. You see, he could have easily snapped the neck of Lucifer and thrown him into hell, but that isn't part of the plan. You know, Lucifer's left out there, left out of hell to give people a choice. But now for this flaming sword... This is the most deadly weapon known to man. Lion, tiger, bear, wolf, angel, devil, or any other creature. Most deadly weapon known to any creature. The sword can pierce and slay the dragon. It is the sword of the Lord. And the thing is, you hold the sword of the Lord in your hand. The cherubims had the flaming sword, which turned every way. Made by God. You got a sword made by God. In your hand. He's given it to you in book form. You have the weapon completed and in perfect form. You see, we don't use it to fight physical battles. We use it to fight the forces of darkness spiritually. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world. They're spiritual. So remember that. We don't war after the flesh. We fight spiritual battles. You see, Adam had a small piece of the weapon with the few pieces of the words of God that he was given back there in Genesis 3. He failed to use the weapon. You see, the weapon came to the Old Testament saints in dreams, visions, prophets, 
in other ways. What do you think old Lucifer thinks about this sword? He hates it. In Isaiah 27, 1, In that day the Lord with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. If there is a weapon that could put a good whipping on the devil, don't you know he's going to do his best to get rid of it? The devil spent thousands of years trying to corrupt the sword that God has given to the saints. Hebrews 4.12 describes it perfectly. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword is key. It is the instrument God is going to use to end this mess. And right now, if you're following along with me, it's that supernatural book in your lap. That's the sword. It's what you might call a never-ending story. Written by the Ancient of Days, who never had an ending or a beginning. The cherubims had a flaming sword. That was the sword that God gave them. But now more on these cherubims. They were sent down to keep the way of the tree of life. They did exactly what God told them. They did exactly what God told them. Lucifer was a cherub. He didn't do it what God told him. Look what happened to him. But the cherubs, they did exactly what God told them. They had the sword out. The flaming sword. You need to do exactly what God tells you. Have your sword out. But imagine for years and years, the people on earth, back there in the days of Adam and Eve, walking by and seeing those cherubims and seeing them with their own two eyes. Not just hearing stories, but hear it, but seeing, but hearing stories and seeing, there would be no atheists. Each time a family would walk by that garden, the mom and dad would have to explain to the kids the whole story. The kids would be like, Dad, what in the world are those things? And the dad would probably say, Well, son, that's the cherubim. They are guarding that tree in there. You see, your great, 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 great uh, mamma and papa, Adam and Eve, ate off of the tree in there and brought sin into the world. And that's why we have to bring these bloody animal sacrifices to temporarily get forgiveness for all of our sins. And those cherubims are guarding another tree, the tree of life. And the dad would probably say, there's been guys to try to get in there and get some fruit off that tree and they are after it like it's the fountain of youth and they get zapped. They get destroyed by them cherubim. So you need to stay away from that tree. Don't be throwing no baseballs over the fence as an excuse to go over there. And you're going to see, you might see some things over there that you don't want to see. You know, for a while, this would have kept the fear of God in people. You know, hearing that those cherubims over there with a flaming sword and that they need to stay out of there have to warn the kids not to hit the baseball over there. They may have to tell them there's a, a giant gorilla dog thing over there on the other side of the fence to make them stay out. And you know, for a while, this would have kept the fear of God in people, hearing the stories from Adam, passed down from generation to generation, and seeing the cherubims on earth with that flaming sword that turned every way. And I'm sure Lucifer came down and caught up with his old brothers, the cherubs, Maybe he didn't, maybe he did. Maybe they hated each other too much to even, for him to even go talk to them. But remember that Lucifer was the fifth cherub. And this is just speculation, but I wonder if he did come over there and try to tempt those cherubim and say something like, Psst, hey guys, why don't you let your guard down? Let your guard down long enough to let one of these little animated mud balls come into the garden. Let him eat off of that tree and live forever in their sinful state. You know, he might uh, he might have tried to tempt them with something and let, get them to let their guard down. He might have tried to make a new race of eternal sinners that way. Maybe to gather up an army to go against the Lord. Imagine that. Imagine if the devil attempted to get some sinners into that garden to eat off of that tree. That's not too far-fetched. I mean, he got a lot of the angels... He could have tried to tempt the cherubims as well 
and then get the humans <clears throat> on his side too and get them in these uh, sinful bodies that would live forever. You see, Lucifer is wiser than Daniel. But as a, a fallen, lost, hopeless creature, he has no understanding. He's got wisdom, but no understanding. Now, me and you as saved, born-again saints, we can understand that we are weak, too weak, to fight against an almighty God, and we fear things. Lucifer knows the Bible more than any of us, but he is missing the spiritual understanding, and he is without fear. Me and you have fear. Fear is a good thing. He's without fear. Mix Lucifer's wisdom and knowledge with his no understanding and his being without fear. You mix those things together and you have an egomaniac that is so prideful that he thinks that he can win. But imagine Adam walking by on his way to work and seeing those huge cherubim and that flaming sword. And I guess they would have stayed up there until the flood when the Lord would have wiped everything off the map. Adam and those guys had a lot more visible evidence going on than me and you do today. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Those guys back there in Genesis 1-6, through 6, though, could see the invisible. They were revealed right before their eyes. You couldn't miss them. The sculpted cherubs in Solomon's temple were around 15 feet tall, with wings that are over 7 feet wide. So imagine if that was the actual size of what Adam would, was seeing. It says in 1 Kings 6.23, And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. And if a cubit is 18 inches, and you times that by 10, you have 180. Divide that by 12, and you have 15 feet. 15 feet high cherubs. These were some enormous and intimidating creatures. 1 Kings 6.24, and five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub, from the uttermost part of the one wing into the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. Five cubits will come out to seven and a half feet wide. And Ezekiel one five says they have the likeness of a man. So they stand up like a man. The cherubims do. Ezekiel one six says they have four faces and four wings. Ezekiel 1 7 says the sole of their feet is like the sole of a calf's foot. Imagine this. Imagine these enormously tall creatures standing up like a man with wings that are seven and a half feet wide, and their foot, feet look like calves' feet. And Ezekiel 1 7 says they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. Ezekiel 1 8 says they have the hands of a man under their wings. Ezekiel 1 9 says they have four faces, and their four faces are faces that look like a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Imagine that. Ezekiel 1 14 describes them as having ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Maybe that's why we see Lucifer, the fifth cherub, fall as lightning from heaven in Luke 10 18. Imagine the devil walking over to his old buddies, the cherubs, the living creatures. And I'm sure he probably said something like, Why don't you guys just go dark side with me? I mean, a lot of the angels already have. Are you just going to live in eternal, obedient, in eternal obedience to that ego maniac up there in the third heaven? And I'm sure they would have said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then zap, the devil would have moved on. And the cherubs would have been too familiar with the sword to fall for the same tricks that Adam and Eve fell for. They would have just used a sword on them. I mean, they're spiritual be beings. They could have just easily taken that spiritual sword and used it on the devil. I mean, when the Lord wanted to go for a ride and look around at the creation and things like that, he rode up on one of these cherubs. Psalm 18.10 says, And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. 
the cherubs would have been very familiar with their pilot. And that is why it was such a great sin when Lucifer rebelled. He was the anointed cherub that covereth, and he hung around God's throne. Imagine falling, falling from grace, falling from being perfect and that sin and being in that sinful state after being so close to God. But this has been the Supernatural Book, episode number four.